Hello and welcome to the latest webinar as part of the Innovative Law Practice Techniques Series produced by the ABA LP Division's Legal Project Management Interest Group. We welcome today's moderator, Betsy Fahey, and our panelists, Esther Bowers, Carrie Marks, and David Drew. Thank you, Austin. Um, a little bit about uh, the Legal Project Management Interest Group that's producing this webinar today. Uh, we were formed in 2015. Uh, and we currently have eight initiatives that including producing uh, webinar content like you're seeing today. We, we thank you for joining us and to Betsy, especially for moderating our panel today. Uh, before I turn it over uh, to um, Betsy, I want to uh, let everybody know that we are actually using some polling uh, software today, and that polling software is available at this website. Uh, so if you'll take your handheld device and use uh, Safari or uh, Internet Explorer and go to this website, uh, you should be able to see uh, some response blocks, A, B, C, D, or E. And as we ask our polling questions, um, you can uh, log in uh, and, and actually uh, record your responses. Now, if you didn't get this address down, I'm about to switch the slide. We'll actually show it to you again before we do our polling questions. Great. Thanks, David. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the ABA Legal Project Management Committee's sixth webinar in the series Innovative Law Practice Techniques. I am Betsy Fahey, Senior Loss Prevention Counsel at ALAS, which uh, for those of you who may not be familiar with it, is a legal malpractice insurer for many large U.S. law firms. Uh, I'm going to be the moderator for our program this afternoon. We will be speaking about how legal project management can support loss prevention and provide a framework to satisfy ethical obligations. I was excited when David asked me to lead this panel because I think this is a topic that we can all benefit from. Before I joined ALAS last year, I was a corporate partner at Baker McKenzie in Chicago, where I led cross-border mergers, acquisitions, and restructuring. And let me tell you, when you are the lead partner responsible for coordinating the sale of assets and the transfer of employees located in 70 different countries on a single closing date, you certainly start to appreciate the importance of good legal project management. We have all most likely heard webinars or read articles that address how legal project management is now recognized by corporate clients as a core competency for their lawyers. The approach encourages lawyers to clarify their scope of services, develop re reliable estimates, proactively manage an engagement, and improve communications with the client. As you'll hear in today's claims trends portion of the program, a growing problem we are seeing at ALAS is mistakes. Lawyers are making mistakes that are resulting in legal malpractice claims, ranging from missed deadlines to drafting errors and other typographical errors. We at ALAS think this is an area in which legal project management can make a big difference. Several ALAS firms have been early adopters of legal project management principles, and today we've assembled representatives from three of them who have generously agreed to share with you their experiences in this area. Today's panel is apparently brought to us by the letter B, as we have panelists from Barnes & Thornburg, Baker Donaldson, and Brian Cave. Panelists, why don't you introduce yourselves to the group, starting with Esther, and then Carrie, and then David, and tell us how legal project management came to your firm. Thank you, Betsy and David. Um, this is Esther Bowers. I am the Director of Client Service Initiatives at Barnes & Thornburg, and I am responsible for our firm's legal project management implementation and training. And I am co-creator of our firm's BT Value Works program, which is a suite of pricing process program and technology solutions that we design to increase collaboration and improve efficiency in how we deliver legal services we started because we noticed a shift in opportunity in the market and more and more clients were asking for budgets and we also saw an increasing number of RFPs come through that were asking for our um, experience relating to project management and how we plan to apply those, um, apply those techniques to matters in which we've been engaged. And we knew we needed to be proactive and not just to develop an ad hoc solution, but develop more of a holistic approach. And that's how we started off with LPM. And hello, everyone. This is Carrie Marks. Uh, thank you, Betsy and, and David, as well, for asking me to attend. 
Uh, I'm the Senior Manager of Business Development at Brian Cave within the Practice Economics Group. I oversee our firm's pricing and project management functions, and I also helped found and now manage business development for Brian Cave's advisory consulting group, BC Exponent. So our legal project management uh, history began back in the early 2000s, um, and it really started with our tech team that at that time operated as a bit of a skunk works group within the firm. Um, at, back then, our lawyers were reviewing their financial matter economics on paper reports, and a group of our IT engineers thought that there were ways to improve this. And so they pioneered uh, a visual financial dashboard so that our lawyers could view their practice financials uh, in a in a more uh, real time and robust format, and this was a very successful initiative. It broadened the dialogue between our our tech folks and our lawyers, and from there we pioneered a lot of different initiatives, including uh, data analytics and other technologies that helped um, pretty radically change the delivery of legal services. And we embraced the revenge of the nerds moniker. So I love this uh, this slide. This is David Roof. I'm the legal project management officer uh, at Baker Donaldson, uh, and and like Esther and and Carrie, uh, our group is responsible for project management, pricing, process improvement, and supporting technologies, including um, Baker Manage, which is a, a legal project management system uh, that we developed. And our team is responsible for implementing. Um, you know, those approaches and that system for our clients, uh, as well as um, uh, working with in-house legal teams to, to implement that system. So this, this slide is, is perfect right on point uh, and is how we were um, exposed to the concept of project management and what it could do uh, to improve client service. So we were part of a team of uh, accountants, engineers, environmental scientists, uh, project managers, and lawyers who bid on uh, a recovery program for Hurricane Katrina. Uh, we were successful, and uh, under the uh, guidance of a state project management office, we were required to manage that program within federal spending caps. And so for the first time, the lawyers from our firm, we were uh, exposed to preparing monthly budgets, providing estimated headcounts on a monthly basis and continually evaluating our processes for efficiencies uh, and also managing um, to budget. So within these requirements, something really incredible happened. Uh, once we did a budget and got the client to approve to that budget and then managed to it, our bills were paid without question. And that was one of the first times that I'd ever had that experience. And so uh, we brought that methodology back to Baker Donaldson uh, and, and developed our own uh, process to implement with our clients and, and the rest is history. Great. So as you can see, Esther, Carrie, and David have some unique experience that can help us walk through what legal project management is how it reduces mistakes, and how it can support a lawyer's ethical obligations. Our hope is that at the end of today's webinar, you will be able to understand what legal project management is and how several firms are implementing it with their lawyers, explain how malpractice claims have changed over the last 12 years, explain how legal project management supports a lawyer's ethical obligations, explain how legal project management can help lawyers reduce mistakes, and describe how technology is currently being used to implement legal project management. David, are you perhaps on mute? I'm on mute. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> thanks again to all three of you for joining us today. And uh, we wanted to start out with some polling questions just to get a general idea of the makeup of our audience. So if you will go to the web address that's at the bottom of this slide, uh, and you will see uh, the options pop up to select A, B, or C. We'd like to get an idea of uh, who's attending, uh, who's in our audience today. So if you would identify your role uh, that you serve in your organization by going to that website and, and providing some responses. And I see responses are coming in. I uh, appreciate that. So we'll give it a second here.
looks like we're still getting some responses. All right, so we had five people on that one. So I'm just gonna go ahead and, and see what our results were. So it looks like uh, primarily we've got legal project management professionals uh, and we have some other legal professionals. Uh, so thank you for that. All right, we're gonna go to our second polling question. Second polling question, has your firm implemented any type of formal legal project management program? Please select A for yes, B for no, C it's in the works but not yet implemented, or D you don't know. Go ahead and vote now. Right, and it looks like we have a few responses with 100% saying yes, you have implemented a formal legal project management program. So we have some um, skilled professionals on the phone. That's great. Uh, all right, we'll go to our third and last polling question, and this is about uh, clients' interest in LPM programs. The question is, do your clients' outside counsel guidelines or RFPs include project management requirements such as a project plan or a detailed budget? A, yes, many of them require LPM generally, but do not specify the requirements. B, yes, many require written project plans, detailed budgets, and a requirement to request approval before spend deviates from the budget. C, no, and D, I don't know. Please vote. Okay, it looks like uh, predominantly yes, your clients are uh, showing an interest in LPM, either requiring it explicitly uh, or generally. And there's one that said no. Interesting. So now we'll talk about where where mistake where where last claims are coming from. As you can see from this slide, we see roughly the same number of number of claims brought against lawyers in both the transactional space and the litigation space. Uh, during most of our history at Alas, unworthy clients and conflicts of interest were driving these claims against our lawyers. Mistakes were not a big concern. However, in the last 10 to 15 years at Alas, we have seen a dramatic rise in claims related to mistakes. In fact, in each of the past six years, mistakes were the leading cause of claims against our lawyers. And in each of the last two years, mistakes were present in over 70% of the claims that we analyzed. Uh, mistakes arise from missed deadlines, sloppy work, failure to clarify responsibilities, and poor communication. Another significant area where mistakes may arise relate to fixed fee matters, where a law firm underestimates the work required and then throttles down because they're not getting paid for that work. At Alas, we think this increase in mistakes has something to do with other changes in the environment in which lawyers practice, including increased cost pressures from clients and the increased pace of the practice, requiring lawyers to deliver services at a much faster pace. These can result in the disaggregation of responsibilities and outsourcing with no clear project manager and the erosion of safety nets, which were available to lawyers in the past. For instance, lawyers no longer have the luxury of sleeping on it because clients expect an immediate response. And many clients have a laundry list of items they will not pay for, like legal research and internal team meetings. Or they want to limit the number of lawyers and staff on a matter, meaning that there may no longer be a second or third set of eyes providing an additional layer of quality assurance. As these safety nets erode, the industry needs a replacement model to help address mistakes. Good legal project management can ensure that all of the necessary steps are put into a project plan and that none of the deadlines are missed. It can improve our communications with clients and help define the scope of the law firm's engagement and responsibilities. But it's also important that firms using legal project management don't blindly rely on its metrics and budgets as an excuse to cut corners or to otherwise skimp on quality. 
all this brings us nicely to our $64,000 question today. Uh, when we're all talking about legal project management, I think everyone in the audience would like to hear about this. So what exactly is legal project management? Esther, why don't you start us off here? Well, Betsy, we get a lot of questions on this subject. And I, in fact, before I engaged in uh, learning about LPM, I too had the same questions. What exactly is it? Um, but what we see and we find is so rewarding within our LPM workshops is that each person within the workshop has their own aha moment where they begin to understand how project management concepts can be applied and be very effective in how they manage their matters. So at its essence, LPM is really about a process. Right, I'll chime in on that. Uh, you know, no matter how it starts at any given firm, I think it really boils down to just having a high level process that is followed consistently. I absolutely agree. And, you know, the, all of the um, representatives, Carrie and, and Esther today from law firms have technology that supports their project management process. And what's difficult sometimes is that's where the lawyers, re, you know, gravitate to. It's, oh, it's a product. It's a, it's a piece of software that I can plug and play. Um, but, but in reality, as, as both of them said, it is a process that we're, we're trying to follow to provide better services to a client, um, to have better performance inside the firm, and the technology is just a, a tool to facilitate that. All right, David, we're constantly trying to debunk the myth that it, uh, LPM is a technology or a software-based solution. Um, but the process of LPM that we are all talking about today um, really includes four main phases, and those four phases are the engagement phase, the planning phase, execution, and closing. And, and before we get kicked off on, on describing for you uh, what occurs in each one of these phases of the, of the legal project management process, we want to talk a little bit about legal ethics um, and how it uh, is can be accomplished uh, using uh, these phases of legal project management. So when I taught my first law school course on legal project management, as I prepared for the class, I was trying to figure out a way to make this resonate uh, with my students. Um, and as I searched for a way to make that connection, I realized how closely, uh, and you'll see this as we walk through it today, how closely LPM is tied um, to our obligations um, to, in, in the practice of law. Uh, and if you look out at the ABA model rules, you can see that what we're doing in LPM, it's really not a new thing. It, it's really just a process, as we've all talked about, to ensure that we're providing that good service to the client and that we're meeting um, our ethical obligations. So as we go through this panel today, we're going we're gonna to talk about the phases of LPM and also tie that back um, to the ABA model rules, and then also have Betsy from her uh, from her perspective tell us how that, uh, in addition to satisfying our eth ethical obligations, how uh, can we use these tools to uh, avoid mistakes and improve communication with clients? That's right. So moving into what what is legal project management, we we discussed the four phases. So first, what happens in that engagement phase, Esther? Well, really at the engagement phase, the lawyers are encouraged to have conversations with their clients and asking key clarifying questions relating to what does success look like? Who are the stakeholders in the matter? Which business units are involved and whose budget does this affect? Um, we ask what will be within scope and we clearly define what will be outside of the scope of this engagement. We look at um, what special skills or expertise will be required, what ge geographies uh, will be involved, and then what risks does the matter pose to the client, um, and, and what kind of alternatives are there to this course of action. Um, we do this in an effort to try to identify these things up front so that everyone is on the same page and we understand, um, we understand the client's expectations and we encourage sharing the same um, information and document with the matter team so that everyone is on the same page. Um, for example, if expectations in the matter are X 
and that changes, we need to go back to the client and revisit the risk assessment. And, and now your lawyers are actually folding in the, the detailed scope descriptions into your engagement letters? Yeah, I'll, I'll address that, Betsy. So after implementing LPM for several years, um, we recognized how we could enhance our engagement letters to include some of the same things um, that, that Esther has referenced here so that at the outset of the engagement, we're providing our client with more clarification about um, you know, what, what types of services are we going to provide and what are some of the limitations or clarifications on those services. And so uh, in, in conjunction with our general counsel's office, we began integrating uh, these concepts into uh, our form engagement letters. That's great. And, and to those of you listening on the line, you know, if you have not considered these items in your engagement letters, we'd urge your firm you know, to include this type of detailed scope description in your engagement letters from a loss prevention perspective as well. So Esther, David mentioned a few moments ago that legal project management can help you satisfy your ethical obligations as a lawyer. Can you explain how that applies to the engagement phase? Sure. Um, as you know, one of the most important requirements of the ABA model rules is clarifying expectations with your client, like I just mentioned. And that includes what we're doing for you, what is the cost, what are the limitations of our services, when does this representation end? And if you think about it, you don't go out and hire a contractor to renovate your house or renovate your kitchen and they just start tearing down walls. You put in some parameters you discuss kind of what will be included within um, those fees, what they plan to do, and you do that up front. Um, the ABA model rule 1.2 addresses scope when it mentions that a lawyer shall abide by a client's decisions concerning the objectives of the representation and shall consult with the client as to the means by which they are to be pursued. So in LPM, we often talk about clarifying what is out of scope with the client this concept is also addressed by the ABA model rule in 1.2, Section C, in which it says a lawyer may limit the scope of representation if the limitation is reasonable under the circumstances and the client gives informed consent. And this is usually what we do within the, the scoping arrangements that we create. Um, the ABA model rule 1.0 also addresses informed consent. and. It says that informed consent denotes the agreement by a person to propose course of action, or course of contact, conduct, excuse me, after the lawyer has communicated adequate information and explanation about the material risks of and reasonably available alternatives to the proposed course of conduct. Um, so what we see is in the engagement phase provides a real step-by-step -step approach to ensure that the lawyer's are meeting their client's objectives with every new engagement. Whether they are included within a form engagement letter or a checklist, um, these simple steps at the outset of an engagement will make sure that you're off to the right, on the right foot with your client. Um, we also counsel that the, these are used if you haven't done one on the outside of an engagement, but for some reason um, something may be going uh, sideways in a matter or you have uh, a client that's dissatisfied, we encourage the use of um, stopping what you're doing, kind of looking at uh, the, the rest of the matter, what's gonna be what we consider to be um, um, still outstanding tasks, and kind of establish what's gonna be going on with, for the uh, kind of scope it at that point even, where um, both, both the parties are understanding what we will, what we will do and um, what will be considered outside of scope moving forward. Okay, great. Now moving on to the, the second phase, um, the planning phase. Now that's where the budget is developed, Carrie? Carrie, are you on mute? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, exactly. This is the, the phase at which the budget is developed and we're, and we're really putting together the comprehensive proposal. Um, we, our, our pricing team spends a lot of time working with our lawyers and their clients on uh, alternative fee arrangements, which everyone knows are increasingly attractive in the market, um, so that we can best meet our clients' needs and also balance the risk to uh, the firm. 
uh, at our firm, we have a formal review process for any alternative fee arrangement uh, prior to intake. And three members of our management committee review all of our AFA requests uh, prior, again, pr you know, that's negotiated prior to uh, matter intake. We work with about 80% of our top 200 clients in our pricing group, meaning that percentage of our top clients are engaging in alternative fee arrangements. And we estimate that of those clients, uh, we are likely saving them 10 to 15% of their legal spend uh, while also improving the predictability of their, um, of their legal budget and of course the operational success of their matters. So uh, it's really these, these budgets and these um, fixed fee or other billing arrangements that are the crucial inputs at this um, planning stage. And we find you know, lots of our clients are, are interested in alternative fee arrangements such that it's really sort of table stakes and, uh, and it, it generally results in deeper client relationships and ongoing work. So specifically, uh, during the planning stage, this is when you're developing a project plan to define the tasks in terms of what steps need to be done, uh, who's responsible for each of the tasks, the overall staffing and leverage of the matter, and the timing in terms of uh, relevant milestones or delivery deadlines. Uh, you're setting the budget based on the scope of the matter and any information you may have learned during the engagement stage. And you're also taking into consideration any assumptions that you've developed uh, during some of the calculating. And then uh, it's at this stage that, that we set up reports that will help keep the attorneys kind of on the rails as they manage to the billing arrangement through the course of the matter. Uh, and we also at times uh, implement technology solutions if it's a highly complex case, for example, to capture case information and, and perform data analysis that they can use to increase their own efficiency. And presumably, by developing this kind of comprehensive plan for executing the matter, you're not just cutting costs, you're also helping to prevent mistakes by making sure that nothing slips through the crack and documenting upfront exactly who is responsible for which portion of a matter. So that way, if a client, for instance, fails to make its tax election on time, but it's clear from the project plan and budget that filing the tax elections is something the client chose to do internally, and they can't point their finger back at the law firm. So mm -hmm. also I'd note your plan should be incorporating review time to make sure that there's adequate partner or peer review time to prevent mistakes. And Carrie, how does this approach also help lawyers meet their ethical obligations? Right, well, uh, you know, needless to say, every lawyer should evaluate their local rules um, but in, in my estimation, this helps a lawyer meet their obligations um, under model rule 1.5 that takes into consideration fees and rule 1.4 regarding communication. So for example, in rule 1.5, uh, it states that a lawyer shall not make an agreement for an unreasonable fee and that the factors to be considered include time and labor required, difficulty, skill, fee customarily charged, et cetera. So during the budgeting phase that we just talked about, that is when our lawyers can do a better job of estimating the work and thereby estimating the fee. If the lawyers follow that process and develop a solid scope on the budget, then this helps them satisfy their obligation under Rule 1.4 Section B, which states, a lawyer shall explain a matter to the extent reasonably necessary to permit the client to make informed decisions regarding the representation. So the steps that we talk about in the planning phase are extremely important uh, so that the client is, has, has solid information about the intended cost and scope of the services to be delivered. And this ensures uh, that the client is armed with information to make strategic decisions about how they will proceed in the case, uh, just as it 
allows our lawyers to meet their ethical obligations. Great. Now let's talk about the execution phase, David. What's happening here from a legal project management standpoint? Other than obviously this is when the lawyers are delivering legal services to the client. So during the execution phase, we're taking all of that work that we've developed in the uh, engagement and planning phase, and we're delivering the services to the client. And in today's market, high expectation for us to manage to that price or manage to that budget that uh, we have have developed with our team. And you know, earlier uh, in the in the presentation, we talked about how LPM doesn't really require technology, uh, but in this phase, you know, technology gives us the ability to more proactively monitor legal spend and communicate with our team and the client. You know, a minute ago, Carrie talked about, you know, developing reports and budgets. Um, and as we're all, you know, under the mantle of the billable hour and trying to produce as much during our workday, these technological tools can really help us kind of, you know, pay attention to those other cases that are kind of already in the works uh, and make sure that we are actually proactively managing those um, instead of, uh, you know, waiting until the 30-day bill to come through. Um, and, and, you know, I think part of the, one of the keys here from a project management perspective is making sure that we're encouraging our team members to make daily or at least weekly time entries so that the reporting we're getting is actually giving us information that we can manage with. Um, and, it, you know, this allows uh, attorneys then to see more quickly, uh, you know, has the, was, is the budget that I've developed, is it still, uh, you know, consistent with what we're experiencing in the case? Has there been some scope creep here that we need to, to have a conversation with the client about? Um, you know, essentially, we're, we're working to adjust that scope of work for new issues that come in, new as, or assumptions that may have changed. Um, and, you know, part of this also uh, a recommended, you know, project management tool is change control uh, log or a change control process where we go to the client to let them know about these new issues that are coming up in the case that are going to have an impact uh, on the legal spend before we do the work and before we send them the bill. You know, a constant theme you hear from in-house counsel or clients is they hate getting those surprise bills which is the first time they hear about a new issue in the case. So implementing a change control process where you're actually evaluating the issue and getting with the client, letting them know what to expect, helping them, letting them make some uh, strategic decisions before the time is billed, uh, I think is a key component um, of this phase. And, you know, I think LPM also adds more reg regiment and controls to the operation of the legal team. So if you think about the ad hoc inter office conferences that clients hate, you know, a partner walking down the hall, bouncing ideas off of people that are unscheduled or are kind of at the whim of the individual attorney, LPM gives us the opportunity to create regular meetings, have those meetings serve a defined purpose and have results come out of those meetings. And in our experience, when you follow that type of regiment, um, clients are more willing to pay for those conferences because we're sharing information uh, and trading strategy. Um, so, you know, during this phase, one of the key, I think the key point that I'm trying to make with all of what I just said is communication. Communication with the client, which is going to be, uh, you know, keep them in the loop, help them be more aware of what's happening, and also communication with the team to ensure that they are um, managing to that plan that we developed at the front end. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, as, as Carrie mentioned in, in, in the uh, planning phase, having a budget to actual report that you can monitor uh, more regularly than the 30-day bill is, is a key component uh, of being successful in this phase of LPM. And I, I just want to just reiterate from a loss prevention standpoint, you know, on this client communication front, that, that's really key. You know, your lawyers should be making sure that they're also documenting these communications with the clients and following up on any action items you know, that they've identified. Uh, in the past several years, an analysis of the recent claims against our firm at a last shows that $255 million in our reserves are attributable to cases in which the lawyers failed to document their advice or their communications with their clients. Um, so, David, what kind of ethical rules are implicated in the execution phase of legal project management? 
We all know that as a matter progresses and evolves, there's going to be new facts and legal issues that come up that may require a change in strategy or may require us to update our budget. Um, and it's very important at this stage to make sure that we're giving the client an opportunity to engage in those system, in, the, in those decisions. And that implicates some of the original rules that Esther referenced, scope and informed consent, um, that you know we are communicating to the client the scope of our representation and we're giving them the opportunity um, you know, to um, you know, make some decisions, strategic decisions related uh, to that information. Um, I think also inherent in this phase is, the, is Rule 1.4 um, on communication, where we're promptly informing the client of any decision or circumstances. We're reasonably consulting with the client about the means by which we are accomplishing uh, their objectives. Uh, and uh, number three to me is paramount in this phase. We're keeping the client reasonably informed about the status of the matter. Uh, and that, you know, comes from us being more proactive in using the plan that we developed uh, in, in the planning phase and the budget um, to, to, you know, monitor our performance, monitor the services and communicate uh, to the client. That's right. So now our final phase of legal project management is closing. What happens at the closing phase, Esther? Well, first, I just want to say I love the closing phase. I think it's really powerful because it's right for business development opportunities, uh, client service touches, and it's a critical piece in the administrative task. And the closing phase is after the matter has concluded and the legal work has been performed. Um, typically in this stage, the team debriefs to learn about what went well within the course of the matter, what types of things the, the team can improve upon, what work products can be repurposed, where they plan to save that work product for to be accessed at a later time, um, how the firm can be better meet the client expectations in the, in the future. And we recommend summarizing that information, how we met and exceeded the expectations of the client and sharing that back with the client is with results of the, of the matter. Um, at that point, the, you know, the team can in, also conduct an after action review with the client and solicit any other client feedback on the project. Um, we've seen a number of different ways why conducting these debriefs have been so successful with clients, but also internal for internal purposes as well. Um, in fact, one of the recent ones um, is an example in relation to a long piece of litigation that had been going on for a number of years. And at different uh, milestones within the case, they actually debriefed. And it really helped set the team up for success and for the next phase of the litigation. Um, you know, they had kind of debriefed at the end of a trial, and then um, that helped them really set them up for success when um, when it was appealed. Right, and we, we recommend, you know, after action reviews as well, but you know, please make sure that you all talk to your firm counsel about how to, to conduct those debriefs because it's great to document good comments, but if things do go wrong or there's some negative feedback, firms need to be careful about how that's captured so that it doesn't come back uh, in a harmful way for the firm. Sure, Betsy. And, um, and it's within the closing phase that we say that it's, we emphasize the importance of an administratively closing the matter um, so that we don't have problems with matters hanging open for infinity and clogging up our conflicts. Um, so the closer, closing phase is where we, we request that we administratively close the matter with the client. And you are preaching to the choir there because that closing the matter is also very important from a loss prevention standpoint. Our closing matters helps avoid conflicts by converting current clients to former clients. Uh, closing the matter also makes it clear that lawyers have no further duties to the client, for example, if the law changes. And finally, closing matters can support arguments that if they're not already running, that statutes of limitation and repose on legal malpractice actions are running once the firm closes the matter. So ideally, lawyers should be sending a closeout letter to the client on the matter as well, although we know that that can be a challenge sometimes. Uh, and sir, how does the closing phase relate to a lawyer's ethical obligations? 
Well, of course, if you have involved the client in this phase, you're giving them an opportunity to communicate about ways you or your team can improve. And this relates directly to ABA Model Rule 1.4. And another rule that is impl implicated in this stage and not normally mentioned in the context of LPM is Model Rule 5.1 regarding the responsibilities of the supervisory lawyer. Um, basically, this rule reads, and relates to a partner um, in the law firm and relates to the management of all lawyers on the team. And they say that they shall make reasonable efforts to ensure that the firm has in effect measures to ensure that all lawyers in the firm conform to the rules of professional content, conduct. So within the closure phase is an excellent time to provide a forum for younger lawyers and other legal professionals to ask questions and learn for future matters. That's great. And, and now that takes us to maybe what's the real $64,000 question. So how do you motivate your lawyers to adopt this approach? How did you guys get the lawyers in your firms involved in your project management efforts, and how did you train them? Can you guys answer that question? Carrie, let's start with you. Sure. Um, really, at Brian Cave, there wasn't uh, a, a direct mandate from above or a formal rollout uh, of, a, of a new initiative around legal project management. It really grew uh, somewhat organically out of a spirit of experimentation and improvement. And it was, it was really a matter of some relationship partners uh, asking questions about how they could better manage their portfolios or their deals uh, and, and asking questions around how technology might be able to support them. So given how organically it developed, um, like I said, we don't have a formal rollout necessarily, but I will say that we do train everyone, all the timekeepers in, at our firm on uh, their financial dashboard that I mentioned at the start of the call so that they can uh, monitor their practice economics in real time and, and drill down um, from, from the client level all the way down through the matter level and all the way down to um, individual uh, time entries. And we'll show that in a, in a bit. But um, any time that one of our engagement teams has a special fee arrangement, like a fixed fee or a collared arrangement or, um, or even a blended rate or, or a volume discount, uh, we set up reporting that we push out to those teams uh, so that they can monitor and manage that billing arrangement. We have found that some of our lawyers will pro proactively seek that information on their own, um, but we, you know, through trial and error found it that our, our best practice was to push it, uh, push those reports out, and we can customize the subscriptions around that based on their preference for um, uh, various, you know, how, how often they want to review those reports. And we've found in terms of adoption, there's really a bell curve, uh, and some are early adopters and grasp this right away and are very eager to engage with these reports or the technologies. Uh, some, once they're taught how to interpret this information, they, they adapt. And then there's always going to be those few who uh, are, are in the thanks but no thanks category. Uh, Barnes and Thornburg, um, as I mentioned, we took a little bit of a different approach um, than, than Brian Cave did and Carrie and David at uh, Baker Donaldson. We, we initially evaluated potential external partnerships and ultimately decided to go with Law Vision for the LPM content training and materials. Um, we then complemented this by purchasing a Prospero product called Umbria provide kind of project management and software so we can monitor the matters in real time. And what we did, we began rolling out the trainings, our LPM trainings, in December of 2015, so almost two years ago. Um, first, we had Law Vision do a one-day train-the-trainer session with four lawyers that we identified and four administrative professionals who we tapped to use for workshops around the firm. 
And then Law Vision conducted our first two training workshops so we could kind of observe and model how we plan to roll it out beyond the first two training workshops for the other firm. Um, I will say that one of the members of our training team is a lawyer in our professional responsibility group at the firm, and having his involvement and perspective has, has really been able to provide real firm examples of issues that could have been avoided and is a tremendous asset to our training team. Um, so we initially picked two offices in which to first roll out our LPM workshop program, uh, one being our largest office in Indianapolis, and then the other one we selected was in a geographic location in which our rates were viewed as high and we wanted an opportunity to uh, differentiate ourselves in the market and kind of take the focus and take the conversation off of our hourly rate um, and focus it more on value and what we could provide. Um, so the first people to come to our workshops were just interested partners, kind of just those who were looking for a way to differentiate themselves in the market, some that had um, client demands with respect to budgets. Um, it was interesting to hear from each person in the room kind of their motivation for coming and their reasons for coming. Um, so it was purely voluntary. It was not firm mandated. Um, and then the word started spreading. We had projects that resulted from those initial two workshops. We focused on um, effective implementation with those projects so that we could see precisely, not just from a training perspective, but how do we um, support attorneys after they've gone through the workshops in, in implementation of this within their own practices. Um, and so we got some early wins and we were able to kind of leverage those and promote those and word just started to spread. Um, so now at this point, we have a roughly about 170 lawyers who have been trained in legal project management. Of those, we have roughly 120 of those are partners, which um, equates to roughly 37% of our partnership has been through an LPM workshop. And we have uh, roughly 110 people who are using our Umbria Matter Management software. So um, that's really... A you know, it's over a third of our lawyers who are either trained in LPM or actively using Umbria. Um, within our firm, we have the, the attorneys act as project managers, and typically it's the lead partners on the case that we see getting really involved in this. And we were surprised by that because we thought initially that it would be kind of the non-equity partners or senior associates because they'd be you know, interested or maybe most hip to the process, given that, um, given the technology component. But in practice, we've really been seeing LPM being driven by our corner office partners um, because really they're the ones who are on the firing line with the clients and they've seen how it can really benefit their client um, firm relationships and how it can be a market differentiator and a helps and how much it has been so effective like I said, within the relationships externally, but also how they've developed internal talent as well. Um, we haven't seen as many junior lawyers kind of get it just yet. Um, I think that might be because their compensation is not directly impacted or they don't entirely understand yet about how um, the law firm functions as a business. Um, but we try to involve them as much as possible in the budgeting in the upfront conversations, they understand the process, they understand the value in it, and they begin to get, we see them get excited about how their piece fits into the larger picture. And when, when we have those conversations and they've been involved in it, um, they have more, they feel more invested in the, in the course of the matter, and it's a really good training opportunity for them. And we've seen them work more efficiently, and we've seen them um, work more collaboratively. Um, so that's been our uh, experience experience to date. We um, have not been uh, widely promoting or widely granting access to our Umbria software because we really want those who are using it to be understanding the LPM concepts. And so we, we've initially used the LPM trainings as a gatekeeper for granting access to um, our Umbria software. 
Thanks, Esther. Real quick, I'll, I'll talk about our um, our implementation. You know, we uh, at the at the time we were rolling out our our program, um, there was still a little bit of business case that had to be presented. Um, why LPM? What is it? And and what advantages is it going to bring? And so uh, we started out with some focused pilot implementations with um, two of our uh, innovative lawyers uh, implementing it with their clients and client teams. And we, we, it, it really helped us kind of reconfigure a little bit how we were approaching this. Um, it was, it was a, you know, a pilot project that really resu result, resulted in some changes to the way we were approaching LPM. And then once we did that, we had now some success stories that we could talk about. And we had also streamlined what we were doing because of the feedback that we had gotten from these two teams. And so we then started to conduct, um, uh, you know, presenting at, at every practice group meeting, presenting at department meetings, um, you know, talking about the advantages that we had seen. Um, and then we started looking at, okay, do we, we wanted to do, you know, training across the firm and we evaluated, you know, whether, uh, you know, we focus on shareholders, associates, or, or basically train everybody. And at that time, there was um, a lot of buzz in the marketplace about firms that were doing firm-wide training, training all lawyers on this process. Our concern was that we would do the training we would not get shareholders uh, or partners to attend. And then if they did attend, you know, we had no guarantees that they were going to go out and implement it. So we, we kind of had a two pronged approach. The first approach was we're going to go train the associates. We want them to get off on the right foot. And so uh, and we could we could urge them to attend the training, um, you know, by giving them maybe some some credit for the time they spent in the training. So we trained the associates first to give them a good foundation in the right way, uh, we believe, to practice law. And then for the shareholders, it was more strategic. So we integrated the LPM methodology into our pricing process. Um, because in our opinion, you know, when you're developing a pricing proposal for a client, you need to be doing some of the same things in the planning phase that Carrie talked about earlier. And so we integrated that into that process. And so, you know, we are now working with our lawyers through our pricing process. Every time we get somebody coming to us for an AFA proposal, uh, and maybe even blended rates or whatever, we're working with them to go through this scoping and budgeting process to make sure that the price we propose to the client uh, is, is the right price. And then also we are um, providing monthly webinars. Uh, we did some um, very short uh, webinars to get, uh, some some preliminary training done on you know what is project management how can you implement it in your practice uh, what is budgeting you know best practices what are pricing best practices and then what's the supporting technology that you can make use of to um, you know improve your management of your cases uh, and then uh, communicate with clients and we've had we've had real success with that because when we work with somebody we can always send them to a 30 minute webinar uh, and they can get a real uh, quick overview uh, of what we're trying to accomplish. That's great. Now, before we get to takeaways, I want to talk a little bit about technology and the technologies that you guys are using to support this process. Carrie, you, you started off talking a little bit about the technology that was being built at Brian Cave. Why don't you walk us through this? Sure. Uh, so I mentioned the financial dashboard that we developed early in the, in the early 2000s and that we do train all the lawyers in our firm on how to view their, their practice economics. One of the modules in this tool, uh, you probably can't see, but there's a tab at the very top of, your, of the screen that's called the planning tab. And so everyone has access to this tab uh, just since we were just talking about change management and in all candor, um, even though all of our attorneys have access to this and can, and can model a team or pricing if they choose, they, they do tend to come to our pricing team anyway. But uh, our, our pricing team and our lawyers can utilize this uh, module in our tool to develop really optimized, efficient teams and to uh, configure a billing arrangement that is attractive to their client. Often that is discussed 
uh, up front between the client and the lawyer. They may articulate that they're looking for uh, a blended rate across the whole team or a particular fixed fee. So that is one um, technology that we have. And just to sort of walk through some of the call-outs here, uh, item number one is where they can click and they can add timekeepers that will all be engaged on the matter and that kind of goes out to the right. Uh, item number two is where they can add phases and they can add any uh, number of phases no matter what kind of, if it's litigation or um, an M&A deal, they can kind of phase uh, the arrangement. Item number three will pull in our cost tables and our rate data so that that analysis is automated. Um, item four is where they select one of those tabs to, to model various billing arrangements, whether it's just a straight discount or a blended rate or a fixed fee or a fixed fee with a collar. And then item, item number five is the box where they can kind of spot check and make sure that the financials are going to cover the risk for the firm. And so uh, once a matter is underway, um, our attorneys work with, with some bespoke data collectors that we've built through the years to capture matter data and to be able to uh, you know, manage the, the case or just capture data and then have it available uh, and stored in a database for analysis. So um, here we have uh, one of our data collectors, our technology is called Crosslight, and it's highly configurable technology where um, you can configure the form very specifically to what is uh, important in that particular case. Uh, then the technology will generate alerts and reporting. So in this example, um, the client requests a uh, budget alert. Uh, every 30 days. And so this will alert our team to that in, that the client's expecting the, the budget report um, in several days. And so our team can take action. And obviously that is uh, that prevents uh, some loss or minimizes it. And then finally, as we've discussed, our attorneys can can monitor, the financials real time. So they can see the adherence to the budget as, as David said earlier, you know, it's so important to see that real time throughout 30 days and not at the end of the 30 day period. And so this last slide shows uh, just a summary view of a, a client uh, in our dashboard and it, it depicts the client relationship over time uh, and it includes collections through the years, um, what we call practice area penetration, so where we've had work with that particular client, and some other indexes that we uh, that we tend to measure. Okay, so these technologies are allowing the lawyers managing the project to monitor during the execution of the project information about how many hours are being spent by the team, uh, how this matches up to the proposed budget. How does it work in practice when a lawyer must make an adjustment within the middle of the transaction or if the litigation changes? So, for instance, what if the associate tagged with doing a certain task uh, takes too long or their client's requests have expanded? So how does legal project management help you spot this and how does it help the lawyers handling it? Well, it depends. Um, if the engagement is a fixed fee arrangement, then the firm bears the burden of any inefficiencies. But if it's a traditional budget, then scope becomes key factor. And our lawyers start negotiating a change order with the client. Um, if it's in, within scope, however, then the firm is usually stuck with it. Um, however, we've been able to use um, our product Umbria to stay up more on top of this. Um, this slide kind of is the attorney dashboard and allows the firm to catch budget to actual discrepancies more quickly. Um, this is a matter level performance slide that is provided um, um, as, in, as well so you can see kind of the budget to actual based on phase level. So you can see kind of the burn rate of the course of the matter. Um, obviously this is only effective if you have diligent time entry practices, but 
our term, our firm requires a three-day entry, but you know this doesn't always happen. But um, by having real-time access like this, it helps drive um, some of those um, best practices with respect to time entry. Um, right, what you're seeing now is kind of our um, access to real-time diary narratives. So instead of receiving this at the end of the month on a pro forma. Um, a partner or a matter manager can actually see this information real time um, and be able to make a necessary adjustments, um, Betsy, to address kind of the, the question that you had relating to how to make those changes mid-course in the course of a matter. So sometimes we get questions related to is technology required? Um, so there are some project management information systems out there. Many larger cor corporate clients are already implement software systems for e-billing and are now beginning to integrate LPM con concepts. So think phase and task coding, for an example. Um, there are several web-based project management systems and software vendors that are developing software applications which are specialized to legal project management. But if you're looking for a no-tech system, you know, there are forms and templates that can be reused for project management implementations. For example, think, think about um, scoping statements, uh, statements of work, budget templates, and uh, different uh, periodic reconciliations with budget to actual reporting. Great. So let's just wrap up with some takeaways here. Uh, I think, you know, Esther, you talked about this a little bit earlier, but it seems to me that it's critical um, to sharing, share your budgets and your plans with the associates and the team members at the firm so that they understand what the expectations are, including how much time they should be spending, what their role is expected to be, so they have a bigger picture of the transaction uh, or the matter, both to understand the scope of the engagement, but also to feel more invested in the work. Uh, say, I caution partners need to make sure that if more time is necessary, Due to a learning curve, that associates are properly supervised and that more time is expended to get to the right answer. Um, so if you're tracking an associate's time on a task, then they shouldn't be told to just stop once they've expended the allotted number of hours. They should be asked to report back to the partner or supervising attorney um, to make sure they aren't spinning their wheels or to make sure that the more junior folks are being properly supervised. Because that's one of the things that our claims department has has told us is one of the trends that they're seeing are situations in which associates aren't being given enough oversight. You know, from a risk standpoint, it seems to me that it's far riskier for a firm to cut corners on an engagement uh, that could result in a claim against the firm than it would be for the firm to eat a few you know, hours of lawyer time you know, to make sure that it gets done right because those few hours can help make sure that the job gets done correctly and ultimately grow that client relationship and the firm can learn from that overage uh, to improve and build better future budgets. Uh, so it's important that, particularly for high stakes, big dollar engagements, that there are redundancies built in so that someone senior is reviewing the work uh, or if a form is being used many times over, it needs to really be carefully reviewed uh, so that errors are not replicated going forward. Um, David, why don't we wrap up with how legal project management has helped you as a practicing lawyer? Well, you hear from clients all the time that they hire lawyers based on trust. And I think that um, the thing that I like about, best about project management is that it helps us um, provide more clarity to a client. And I even had a client say this to me, you know, I hire based on trust, but what you're providing me with legal project management provides me more clarity and, and inherent in trust is clarity and an understanding of what my lawyer is doing. And so that's where I think this, this tool set provides the most um, advantages is helping us as lawyers, as we're providing legal services, having a step-by-step -step process that helps us improve clarity and transparency with a client, um, meet our ethical obligations and, and avoid um, mal, malpractice claims. Um, and I think that the thing to remember too is, you know, we've talked about a, a lot of process steps here. Um, one size doesn't fit all. You don't have to do it all or do nothing. Um, you need to just tip, dip your toe in the water by doing a project plan, 
walk through these steps that we've talked about to do a budget or, or to work with a client uh, to be more transparent about your services, and I guarantee you're going to get results. Great. Right, thank you, everyone. Uh, I think we've gone over our allotted time, but I think uh, I think we're all happy to stay on for another couple minutes if there are specific questions from from the audience that Austin that Austin has received. All right, there are a couple questions, and uh, just as an announcement to any of you that are new to go to webinar, if you have any questions, feel free to head over to the panel on the right side of your screen, and there's a question box in there. Uh, you can type those in there, and I will get to your questions as soon as I can. Looks like we already have a couple here. So the first of which is, do your pricing folks communicate directly with your clients or through the partner? This is Carrie. Um, certainly every firm may differ, but we do at times have some of our, some members of our pricing team on calls with clients, but primarily our pricing team uh, works with our lawyers to give them the information and the modeling they need to have the dialogue with their clients. But I'd love to hear from the other panelists too. Hey, I'll take the, I'll take the next one. So this is David. Um, we're we're very much similar to what uh, Carrie talked about. Um, however, one of the things that that we try to do is help our lawyers once we craft a pricing uh, model for them. We try to help them put that in the in terms of it's not necessarily an engagement letter, but I would call it a summary, a pricing proposal summary. So because one of the things we're concerned about is after we go through all this work and come up with a pricing proposal, we want to make sure that any limitations, assumptions you're making or out of scope items are, are accurately communicated to the client. So we will work with our lawyers to convert that model and proposal that we came up with into a document that they can then uh, provide to the client. So we are behind the scenes, but we are definitely helping the lawyer communicate that proposal. In, in our and I'll just add, in our firm, we are seeing an increasing number of opportunities to have our pricing director in the pitch meeting with the with the attorneys. Um, we've seen a lot of success with that because the attorneys have some discomfort when it comes to um, talking about price directly with the client, and a lot of times the client has been bringing their legal app person into the meeting as well, and. So that allows a dialogue between the operations professional and our pricing director to have, um, you know, conversation about what their what their pricing needs are, and then we're able to craft something that um, speaks directly to their needs and proposes a sort of solution. So we've been seeing a greater percentage of opportunities to have um, a dialogue directly with the client. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, it looks like the next question we have is, do you have recommendations for best sources for getting up to speed, aka getting started with LPM? All right. I'm going to take this first, and then I'm going to shamelessly promote the book that I've got on the screen right here that was a book that Susan Lambert and I wrote uh, a couple of years ago and has got um, some great um, case studies in it about law firms that were implementing uh, LPM. It's, uh, you know, we... Um, Esther talked a little bit earlier about no tech implementation using forms and uh, and, and budget templates and and there are some of those included uh, in this book that uh, that was published by the ABA. I'll echo that, right. David, because we used your book as a resource when we got started. So <laughs> I'm thoroughly flattered. Thank you for saying that. <laughs> <laughs> or will you be available for signatures? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'll just chime in also. There's a lot of uh, resource information on the ILTA website. I'll, I'll say this too, because uh, Carrie's absolutely right. You know, one of the things that's happened over the past couple of years is you've got a lot of industry trade organizations that are now, um, you know, really focusing on uh, legal project management. You've got uh, the Legal Marketing Association's P3 conference that is put on every year. Um, as Carrie said, ILTA has, has a section on uh, legal project management. We have an ABA committee that is publishing this webinar uh, or producing this webinar, and, and that's open to membership. So anyone that is interested in joining us, uh, we have monthly meetings. 
Uh, it's a great place to, to trade ideas, talk about things that are working, not working. Uh, you'll find that the group is fairly open about, you know, the success they're having. Um, and then um, there's also a couple of client related organizations that are also looking at project management, and that is the Association of Corporate Councils uh, Legal Operations Group, uh, as well as uh, a new group that's formed over probably the past two or three years, the Corporate Legal Operations Consortium, uh, CLOC, uh, and they have also uh, developed um, uh, some materials on legal project management. All right, looks like we have a couple more questions. Uh, the next of which, uh, how do you get lawyers to adapt these LPM practices? Anybody want to take that one? I'll uh, I'll start uh, because I know Carrie and and Esther have some some really good uh, experiences. But um, you know I think the uh, we started out with success stories. You know lawyers are not you know my impression is lawyers are not going to adopt anything new unless they know it's worked for somebody else. And so you know our first goal was to try and go out and and get some success stories under our belt. And success stories from the from the standpoint of either winning business or securing new business, uh, you know, with an existing client. And uh, we had several opportunities like that. You know, uh, Esther mentioned a moment ago about how what how important the closing phase can be uh, as a de de business development opportunity. Well, we had a success story that hit that on the mark where uh, we were working handling only a few cases for a client. Uh, we followed the legal project management methodology with a key partner, uh, went in and did a closing phase uh, exit interview with the client uh, where they told us that, you know, they had never seen a firm implement the approach that we had. They loved it and, and they gave us some new business as a result of it. So I, I have found it's those success stories. The other two places that I've seen it, you know, get it, where we've been effective in getting lawyers to change is where you've got a lawyer that's maybe trying to rebuild their practice uh, and they're looking for something new besides just legal expertise to add to the table. Um, and, and also for younger lawyers that are looking to build uh, a book of business uh, as you get those young shareholders who are just now breaching into the business development phase, this is a, an added quiver uh, or an added arrow in their quiver that they can use to try and get um, new business. Yeah, this I'll is Carrie. I'll chime. Go ahead, Carrie. I'll chime. Okay, I, I can uh, chime in next. I would say, um, you know, definitely consider your early adopters. Think of those uh, partners and uh, lawyers that are, are leaning towards innovation anyway and who might be receptive to trying a different approach. And then, as David said, you know, you can start to, to broadcast your successes. And so it's very important to track baseline results so that you can then track um, your, your actual results against a baseline. Another opportunity to look for are um, your unruly cases, for example, or deals um, or areas within the firm where there tends to be um, fur flying, for lack of a better expression. We implemented a, a lot of rigor and project management in um, with with client teams that that were managing a lot of serial litigation, where the work was uh, very repeatable but high volume, and we needed a way to better control and track uh, the 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 work. And so uh, again, we we established a baseline, and then we could we could track the results, and that was very successful. And I won't repeat anything that the two of them just said, um, but I will add to to that because we've had success in both those situations. Um, but I'll say we meet them where their needs are. I mean, they come to us for a different sort of need and then we cross sell additional services. So whether they come in because their client's asking them for a budget, that's their first entry point. Okay, so from there, we'll provide you a budget but now we're going to act as consultants and, and recommend a couple of additional next steps. Whether or not they've been through an LPM workshop or not, we're starting to influence the behavior through, okay, you're going to get a budget, but we're also going to go through the exercise of scoping this out. Or 
Now you have a budget. How do you plan to manage to that budget? Um, and just that's how we start infusing some of the LPM concepts. So we meet them where they're at, where their needs are, um, you know, whether or not that's, like I said, they have a need for a budget or um, like Carrie mentioned, we had um, an issue with a particular practice where it was going to be transitioning from a partner that was um, retiring into someone else. And we needed, we, we looked at it from a profitability standpoint. I mean, how do we increase our profit margins on this work that's um, fairly repetitive? Um, so we've been able to kind of infuse LPM in different um, situations in the firm based on their needs. All right, I think uh, we have one more question here. Again, if anyone else has any questions, feel free to chime in. Otherwise, I think this is the last one that I have queued up here. Uh, and it's simply, if a firm does not have the resources to implement a full-scale program, where do you recommend starting? Uh, I'll start. Um, you know, I think that, uh, uh, you know, if you're a smaller firm or you, or you don't have the, you know, the first class resources like a carry or an Esther, you know, that can help, you know, push this with your lawyers. Um, you know, I think the best thing to do is to start with um, a, a legal professional who has an interest in this. I think you've got to have a passion for this. Um, and, and get them trained on it. And, you know, you don't necessarily have to, um, you know, get a, a professional project management certification, but there's, there's a lot of different um, training programs that involve. Get them in training and then, you know, get them into the firm. And, and I agree, look, Carrie made a really good point, and that is look for those problem matters. You know, one of the things that we've tried to do here recently is we look for those cases that have really bad write-offs and write-downs. Um, because, you know, that is money that is being lost, time that's being invested by your lawyers and, and, and being lost. And I think an easy place to start would be, you know, establish your subject matter as expert at your firm that may not be their full time job, but may be part of their responsibilities and have them look at those cases where you've got a lot of that, um, you know, time being left on the floor. Uh, and, and have them work with those teams to see if there is a way to turn the corner. And once, once you have a success story under your belt or you've helped uh, a team or, or, or a, 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 an attorney on a particular matter, you know, go from having, you know, 10% uh, or 15% of all the time being written down or off, and you've now turned that into something that maybe, you know, standard realization, you know, 90 to 95%, um, you now have a success story uh, and people it's going to start a fire that that helps people understand that this is something they need to be implementing.